Thank you, Ray. Can everybody hear me? I feel like I'm wired up, ready to go to space. Um, should have looked at Chris's talk before I put mine together. I think he might have overpromised, and I might underdeliver on some of the things he told me or told y'all I was going to talk about, but we'll try to touch on them. So fertilizing alfalfa, it's a balance. It's a balance between giving what that plant nutrient require the plant nutrient requirement versus what is being supplied by the soil, what we're adding is supplemental fertilizer, and then what we potentially can lose. So soil testing is the best way to guide that balance. Uh, it gives us the current nutrient status of that soil so we have guidance on what we need to add. Also, if you look at this, look at this alfalfa plant here, that's potash deficiency. Hopefully if you're following a good soil fertility program, you're not going to have this because you know what you need to add. It can help diagnose nutrient toxicities or deficiencies. It saves us money. Uh, anywhere, the county extension offices charge anywhere from nothing. Some counties offer free. And the most expensive county, I believe, is about $7 a sample. If that $7 represents 10 acres, that's 70 cents an acre. What other investment can you make in your operation that only costs 70 cents an acre? So that's something really to think about. It saves money. There's two ways to lose money by fertilizing. Doesn't matter what crop you're in. You either apply nutrients that you don't need, wasting money, or don't apply nutrients that need and you cost yourself yield. So that soil sample at $7 can help guide you to add appropriate amounts. If we're adding more than we need and it has the potential to leave that field, get offside into a waterway, by the strictest definition, that's pollution. We don't need that either. We don't need to be in the same scenario uh, Maryland is with the Chesapeake Bay. So we add what we need, not a whole lot more. We're going to be in good shape. And that cost of a soil sample is really, really small compared to either over or under fertilizing. So we want a representative sample. One acre of soil weighs approximately 2 million pounds. So if we have a sample that's representing 10 acres, that's 20 million pounds. That one pound that you put in the box to send off to the lab, we only use one teaspoon of that. So you want to make sure that that one teaspoon that we're putting in to analyze is very representative of the area. So that can be landscape position. It was it on a side slope, a toe slope, or the bottom? Is that soil eroded? Are we looking at something, maybe a, a stalling area? Have a 10 acre field, one area on this dairy farm, cattle's uh, stall there before you milk them. Well, now I take half of my samples in that one acre, it elevates my soil sample that's being submitted, and it's going to over. It's going to say we have more nutrients than actually represents that 10 acre field. So we're going to probably apply not enough fertilizer for the other nine acres. So make sure that one teaspoon of soil that we get to analyze represents the area that you're interested in. Uh, the more samples you take, the closer to reality you're going to be. That's with any number. I can take one group, one person in this group to try to estimate your age and I'm probably not going to be right. The more people I ask the age of, the closer I'm going to get to estimating that age of this group. Same thing with soil samples. We recommend at least a minimum of 10. More is better. Generally, we say you can soil sample every two years. The exceptions are high value crops and crops with high removal rates. Alfalfa fits both of, the, both of those criteria. Again, 60 or 70 cents an acre, that's a small investment to make to make sure that you have adequate fertility for your alfalfa stand. Fall or spring, does it matter? Yes and no. Um, my doctor told me I'm getting a little bit heavy. Buy a scale, lose some weight. So I weigh myself before I go to bed at night and I weigh myself when I got up in the morning. Guess what? I weigh four pounds less in the morning than I do the night. Did I lose four pounds? Yeah, I did, but I gained it right back. What my doctor's interested in is what I'm doing a year or a month out. Same thing with your soil sample. They're going to vary a little bit between fall and spring, but what you're looking at is a trend over time. Look at that soil sample for the last five years. Am I trending up to a level I don't really need to be at, 
or am I not adding enough and I'm trending down? So look at your soil samples over time and adjust accordingly. As Chris, excuse me, as Chris said, four inches, three to four inches for no-till, six to eight inches for tilled um, seabed establishment. Say no more than 20 acres for that area that sample represents. The more uniform that area is, the bigger it can represent. The more ununiformity, the smaller you want that area. Our recommendations that you get back are only as good as that sample represents. So the, the more non-uniformity you have in your field, the smaller I'd make that sample size. So what do we add? This comes from land grant recommendations, stuff that the old timers before me developed and we look at it quite a bit. Limestone, we need to keep our pH around 6.8. We determine that with a water or salt pH and a buffer pH. Phosphorus, you want your soil test phosphorus to be 60. If it's 61, our recommendation is going to be zero. We don't see any benefit to having soil test P higher than that. Potassium for alfalfa, is higher than for most other crops. It has a high potassium demand, 450. If you're at 451, we're not gonna make a recommendation. Our recommendation is gonna be zero. If you're at 300, we're gonna add, we're gonna recommend some. Boron, yes, no, maybe. Um, it depends. If you have a hot water boron, extract, extractable boron of over two pounds per acre, we're not gonna make a recommendation. If it's below that, probably every other year, a pound and a half to two pounds of boron for alfalfa. Molybdenum, that's important for legumes to fix nitrogen. If you keep your pH above 6.2, generally you don't have any issues with that. Get a lot of questions about sulfur. I see about three or four people I've talked to sulfur, alfalfa and sulfur in this room. I'm gonna end up my talk on that, so we'll come back and address that in a few minutes. When to apply nutrients. Generally, timing is not as important as right, but there are exceptions. You know, if your alfalfa is at 10% bloom, that's probably not the best time to pull a lime truck out there. If it's wet, you know, you can't get over it. So what your environmental conditions are, the availability, the time you have to fertilize, and then fertilizer prices fluctuate. Maybe you can catch it a little bit cheaper in the fall than the spring. Uh, Belarus opened a new potash uh, facility. Potash prices went down by 10%. So things like that can influence it. But for the most part, the crop doesn't really care a whole lot when it gets fertilizer just so it has adequate fertilizer when it needs it. The other exception is with alfalfa. Um, luxury consumption of potassium can occur. If you're up in that high range, you can apply more fertilizer or that plant will take up more potassium than it actually needs and you're wasting money. Liming to me is the basis of any soil fertility program. Whether you're growing uh, corn, soybeans, alfalfa, wheat, whatever, pH management is a key. It, you really get a big return for your lime dollar. And what we're trying to do is adjust soil pH. A lot of times we think, oh, it's a, it's a low pH that's hurting the plant. True, not true. The hydrogen ion, the thing that we actually measure, generally isn't what's causing the problem, but that low pH influences nutrient availability of these essential nutrients. So it's, we're really trying to monkey or adjust um, the nutrient availability. We want to make sure the ones that we need are available for nutrient uptake, and the ones that we don't need aren't so available that we're getting toxic levels into the plant. So uh, pH influences uh, root growth and nitrogen fixation as well. That's one of the reasons we have a higher pH, target pH for alfalfa than other row crops. And you can actually have limited yields and not even notice it with a low pH kind of hidden hunger. So here's the old bullet diagram that I like to use. We can see here our alfalfa target pH is about 6.8. The bigger these lines are, the more available those nutrients are. So if you look somewhere around 6.5, 6.8, we're catching the fat part of these lines all the way down for most of them. 
I said we want to maximize essential nutrients. Well, phosphorus is an essential nutrient. If we get our pH too high, calcium can tie it up. It's not as available as if it's at a pH of 6.65. If we get our pH too low, iron and aluminum can tie up the phosphorus and then it's not available. Just simply adjusting your pH to this, you know, 6.5, 6.8 range improves nutrient availability. And on the flip side, if you get your pH too low and Please don't let it get down to five if you're trying to grow alfalfa. But then you can actually have root growth or uh, root damage occurring due to this low, low pH, high availability of uh, aluminum. Manganese is another nutrient that can be become toxic when you have too low of a pH. So for the most part, you shoot for that six, five, six, eight, you're, you're where you need to be. How do we neutralize acidity? This is another topic. I could spend the whole 20 minutes on this slide probably, but limestone, ag lime. Most of the stuff we're using is calcitic limestone, don't, dominated by a calcium. Or if you have some magnesium, enough magnesium in it, dolomitic limestone. And what we're going to do here, this is your limestone, calcium carbonate, this H+, plus, that's your acidity. That and that will form carbonic acid and then end up your hydrogen is consumed to form water. Your acidity disappeared, it went to water. Same thing would happen with quick lime or calcium oxide, hydrated lime, burnt lime. These are not very common sources for agriculture, but they are good lime sources, expensive. Pelletized lime, it's essentially the same thing as ag lime. It's just taking the fines, putting them into a pellet, and then it's better, easier to handle in some instances. It's very expensive. $25 a ton roughly for ag lime spread, $250, $300 a ton for pelletized lime. It's not an economical source. Touch on waste products real quick. Some municipalities are using calcium oxide to treat their biosolids, their waste products. Jack the pH up real high, that's used for pathogen control. Instead of paying a tipping fee at the landfill, some places are actually giving these away to producers. If you get a class A biosolid that's lime stabilized, that's a good source for um, managing your pH. And then gypsum, I have gypsum down here in red, calcium sulfate. Some people think, oh, I have calcium, that's what's adjusting my pH. It's not the calcium, it's these oxides uh, or hydroxides. So we had the hydrogens being consumed to form water. With gypsum, we have our hydrogen, we still have our hydrogen. That is not consuming that. If it did, H2SO4, sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid, if it did form, it's going to quickly dissociate and you still have your hydrogen out there. So calcium, um, sulfate or gypsum is not going to adjust your pH. Uh, potassium for alfalfa, you can see the typical pattern. It's going to start at the tip and work in. What does potassium do? Water regulation, disease tolerance helps set up for overwintering. There are large amounts of potassium taken up by the plant. The young tissue typically has the most, and if you look at a sufficiency range for alfalfa, we're between two and three and a half percent. If you have that in the tissue, you're in good shape. If you don't have enough potassium, you don't have, it's an essential nutrient, you will not have good growth. If you have too much potassium, the plant can take it up, called luxury consumption, but now you're using potassium, you're taking up potassium that the plant doesn't need. So we'll talk about this a little bit more, but if your soil test K is over 300, a real good practice is apply after your first and third cutting so you're not putting it all out there at once. If that nutrient isn't out there to be taken up by the plant, it won't take it up. So you'll help limit luxury consumption that way. I don't think anyone's done any math problems yet, so I'm gonna be the first to do that. Um, what we have that known Five minutes, okay. We have a known range, two to three and a half percent. 
This is real data from a, a survey that Ray and I did a few years ago. Had a tissue concentration of 3.7%. Um, we're high producing yields, so we're looking at eight tons per acre or 16,000 pounds. We had 3.7% total. The midpoint of that sufficiency range was 2.7. So we actually have 1% potassium in excess of what that plant needs. Um, Murata potash was 350 a ton two weeks ago at my local dealer, 29 cents a pound. So 1% of 16,000 pounds, I'm taking up 160 pounds of K. But when we talk about 0060, that's not pounds of K, that's pounds of K2O. So multiply 160 by 1.2 to get into pounds of K2O. Now I have 192 pounds per acre of potash in that plant that's not benefiting yield. At 29 cents a pound, I just had $56 worth of potash taken up that's not really doing anything for me. I don't know about you guys, but $56 an acre, that's real money. 560 bucks over 10 acres. So limit what you put down. If you're in the high range, you don't need to put it all down at once. And this is just a couple pictures. Low potassium here in the back. Here's a stand that died because potassium wasn't sufficient. Before Ray and I did the soil, uh, the alfalfa tissue survey, I was doing wheat. I thought, had enough questions about sulfur. I actually found a little bitty spot right here and a couple spots in the field, sulfur deficient wheat. So started getting some questions, he kicked my way, and here was my kind of thought process. Well, we are getting cleaner air, we have better scrubbers, we have higher yields, um, we have less sulfur impurities in our fertilizer, and we have somewhat of a mobile nutrient so it can move throughout that profile to depth. Sulfur removal for alfalfa, five tons per acre. That eight tons, I removed 40 pounds. So talk a little bit about what we know about it and some of the surveys and tissue response trials. Here's sulfur uh, deficient alfalfa compared to a good alfalfa plant. 2001, we're in here, we're getting somewhere 18, 20 pounds of sulfur being deposited per year. 2015, now we're down less than 10 pounds. Oh, maybe we've got something going on. This is the area that we looked, all the, the blue stars are counties where we did tissue surveys for wheat. The red stars are tissue um, for alfalfa. 25 counties out of the 125. So I mean, I feel like we, we looked pretty, pretty wide. Don't try to read these numbers, it's a terrible graph, but all I want you to see here is sulfur. This table here, if they're highlighted, that means they fall below that nutrient sufficiency range. Six of these out of my 25 samples were below that sufficiency range. Scared me to death because I've been saying we don't need to worry about it. So we had five locations that we looked at, put down zero, 25, and 50 pounds of sulfur per acre, collected tissue samples, determined yield for the second and third cuttings. This is that grouped over the five locations. Our second cutting, no difference. Our third cutting, no difference in yield with these added rates. So we do have some places that I, I'm sure there's nutrient deficiencies for sulfur. We just don't have a good mechanism to tell you when or how much you need to add at this point because there's not enough uh, responsive sites in Kentucky. The places to look for them, high removal crops like alfalfa, crops grown in the winter with low mineralization rates, eroded soils, low organic matter, and sandy soils. So we're gonna continue to look at that and try to determine how to best make sulfur recommendations. Um, Wrapping it up, 60 cents an acre. That's a very good investment. Go on and run that soil test. Uh, lime, phosphorus, and potassium are needed. It's a high dollar crop, a high removal crop, don't skip. Luxury com consumption can cost real money. And if you do wanna use gypsum for something and you suspect you have a sulfur deficiency, use it for that. That's the cheapest source of sulfur you can get, but 
all this stuff must work into your system. So that's all I have for now. Maybe I didn't go over and can answer a question or two. Edwin. Yes, sir. So the sulfur test, uh, I didn't get into that. Malik 3 that we use for potassium and phosphorus, it's not very good for sulfur. So I think you would have just about as good of uh, interpretation if your soil test came back peanuts and popcorn as it does a number for, you know, what your soil test value is. If you suspect you have a sulfur deficiency, 25, 40 pounds is what you're removing. We, we have seen quite a bit of sulfur below that four inch sample. So I would probably not go over 25 pounds. If you did, I wouldn't go over 50. 50 pounds would be sufficient. And Myself, if I was doing this, I would leave some strips to see if I truly needed that. So 50 pounds would be plenty. That would be about 200 pounds of gypsum per acre. So you don't need to put tons and tons down. Just 200 pounds would be sufficient. Elemental sulfur. It's going to react slower than gypsum. It has to go through a microbial process, but I'd still put about the same rate down. I wouldn't, I don't see any benefit to going over 50 pounds of sulfur per acre. That's more than going to cover what your removal rate is. I mean, if you're at eight tons per acre, 40 pounds is all you're removing, you're probably still getting 25 or 30 pounds per acre from atmospheric deposition mineralization of organic matter, and then that sulfur that's in the soil profile below f six inches. One more Per unit, correct. You don't need to put 200 pounds of elemental sulfur, but actual unit of sulfur, like if we're talking about unit of nitrogen, you know, 33% ammonium nitrate is different than urea. We put different rates down, but we're still shooting for a total rate. Um, so, correct. I mean, you don't need to put as much elemental sulfur down, but we're still looking at, I would feel comfortable saying 25 pounds of sulfur in whichever form you get it in. Not sulfate sulfur, because they're, but sulfur is going to be adequate. Thank you.